Okay, okay, it's time for you and me to have a moment. I am not trying for the first time in my life to obtain or retain clients. I am paying for all of this shit, which means one thing. I am going to be fucking out of control. Anyways, back to our program. The most important, the most important feature of a company that adds billions of dollars of shareholder value in a compressed time frame, you have to serve as an accelerant for young talent. Outside of visionary capital, likely the most important factor is career accelerant. This is a firm's ability to attract and retain the best talent. And a few Fortune 500 companies have figured this out. Jack Welch was hired by GE as a graduate chemical engineer before eventually holding the top job of CEO for over 20 years. General Motors CEO Mary Barra started with GM at age 18, inspecting panels at a Pontiac plant. In 1991, I had a white T-top 84 Pontiac Trans Am. Guess what I had on the back hatch? Spoiler alert, I did, however, learn how to drive in a Pontiac Aztec. <sighs> and as highlighted in their most recent commercial, Doug McMillan's first job at Walmart was unloading trucks at a distribution center. To attract the best human capital, you need to have a high-speed elevator. The best startups and smartest founders also do their best to motivate the best and brightest. And the best ROI on human capital is generally investing in the young and the ambitious. While they are inexpensive and before they obtain distractions, including spouses, children, and perspective, the dirty secret of most successful companies is that the greatest value rests under the iceberg. It's not the CEO, but the number of talented people who are under the age of 30. Show me the quality of people at your company under the age of 30, and I'll tell you that firm's position relative to peers. If that sounds ageist, it is. By the way, when I go to pee every night, Gandalf is sitting there saying, you shall not piss. I can't even pass a bathroom these days without thinking, you know, I might as well pee, I'm here. Anyway, anyway, at the big four tech companies, the median employee age ranges from 28 to 31. At Oracle, it's almost 40. And urinating in TikTok's fountain of youth isn't going to change that. And their energy and desire to succeed, young people, is the success of the rocket fuel for top performing organizations. If you want juniors to act like owners, treat them like owners. Give them equity. If you want them to crawl through shit for you like Andy Dufresne and Shawshank Redemption, then demonstrate tangible proof that the other side is worth it. The remedy to undervaluing employees is simple. Imagine every employee walks into your office with their resignation letter. What would you have done to keep them? Because by the time that happens, it's likely too late. A lot of organizations suffer from the opposite of career accelerants, specifically corporate narcissism and ageism the other way. Many service firms are guilty of this. Partners of law firms believe that because their names are on the door, they're the most valuable piece of the puzzle and responsible for the magic. Most narcissists believe this. Despite what CNBC and TechCrunch would have you believe, the vast majority of startups never demonstrate enough promise to raise institutional capital. Or put another way, they never make the jump to light speed from a practice to an enterprise. Admittedly, this is also a systemic problem as your zip code and gender impact your likelihood of receiving an investment. 89% of venture investments went to all male founding teams last year, and more than 75% went to all white teams, leaving female founding teams to register just 3% of venture investment. And four states account for 80% of this venture investment. So if Jenny in Alabama wants to build the next Uber, she should get a sex change and move. Keep in mind though, keep in mind, moving is a big decision. Anyway. I haven't showered in like three days. Can you smell it up there? Hello ladies, look at your man. Now back to me, now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using ladies' scented body wash and switched to old he could smell like he's me. A strong, manly stack. What's that smell like, Peach Mom? Anyway, as a leader of a business, you should be spending at least a third of your time thinking about your best talent and making sure your rocket fuel still feels like it's on a rocket. 
A winner, the Brachistochrone curve. Business mimics biology and physics. And just as in physics, it's not always a straight line that's the fastest path. The business lesson here, the velocity of a company is set in its first 24 months. The first two years are critical. You need to go at it exceptionally hard right out of the gates. The early days of combat are hand to hand, more like Vietnam than dodgeball, where we'd all like to think that the winners win just because they're good guys. That's not how it works. If you want to be an entrepreneur or part of a founding team or pretty much be in any role that garners significant equity in a new business, forget work-life balance. Google and Facebook can lure people in with free snacks now, but I can pretty much guarantee you that virtual walkouts would have resulted in a non-virtual firing when the firm was nascent. Over in the Oval Office, it's a very different story. It appears infection, incarceration, and indictment are the agency of this administration. How many presidential campaign officials have been imprisoned in the US? Zero before 2016, and five after Orange Hitler came to office. Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, George Papadopoulos. Trump is the only president to have his personal attorney and national security advisor found guilty of crimes. By the way, I know I'm alienating about 40% of you that are overrepresented in government. You know what, I just don't care. Another winner this week, Mayor Pete, with the Supreme Court nomination in full swing, the topic of choice is taking center stage, or specifically, who makes the choice. When Mayor Pete was asked on Fox where he thinks the line should be drawn with respect to late-term abortions, he definitely highlighted it's not where, but who should decide where the line is. By the way, right now, it's essentially a bunch of old men who are procreating in between the commercial breaks of Macmillan and Wife and the Night Stalker. Darren McGavin, a deeply underappreciated artist. While everyone may have an opinion on the topic of choice, most are built on incorrect data meant to evoke emotion versus a more thoughtful, rational discussion. The Republican rhetoric of third trimester abortions is an emotive plea. The reality, 99 plus percent of abortions happen before the third trimester and over 90% of abortions happen before week 13. 95% of women report abortion was the right choice. 61% of women that make the choice already have a child. Four in 10 women cite financial concerns as the reason while a third cite timing. All kinds of women get abortions, but most of them are Christian, 25% are Catholic, and 30% are Protestant. But the dirty truth is the following. Only one in five teen fathers go on to marry the mother of their child. Violence to women is also reduced after abortion as women can break ties with abusive partners. Men, let's face it, it's also us who usually push for unprotected sex. Mayor Pete summarized it elegantly. I think the dialogue has gotten so caught up in where you draw the line that we've gotten away from the fundamental question of who gets to draw the line. And I trust women to draw the line when it's their own health. We'll see you next week.